Bibles, turn with me tonight now to the Gospel of Matthew, the publican, Levi, hated, despised by the people, just like the IRS is today. <laughs> All right. Matthew chapter number one and verse number one. The scripture says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. All right, Father, I thank you for this holy book. Holy, Lord, holy, holy, holy. I pray you'd bless it now in the hearts of the people, anoint it as it goes forth. It's a good seed, Father. Nothing wrong with the seed. The problem's the ground. I pray now in Jesus' name, amen. When you pick up a New Testament canon, the canon I'm talking about is the uh, 27 books of the New Testament. You, you're, the first thing you read in the uh, order that we have it to it, have been brought down to us is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. If you notice, the first thing that's said of him is that he's the son of David. Now, we know that Abraham lived 1,900 years before Christ. And we know David lived about a thousand years before Christ. We've got a span here of 900 years. I mean, Abraham's a little older than David. But it's not about Abraham. Matthew chapter number 1 is about the king. David was the king. He was the only king in the Old Testament that God promised to perpetuate his throne. God said there will never cease to be a man to sit on the throne of Israel. So we have, therefore, the writer of Matthews calling attention to the fact that this is the son of David, therefore with full credentials to be the king. Now come to the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 1, and verse number 1. And it simply says, The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written, uh, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face. He goes right into his ministry. Notice the ministry. There's nothing about a genealogy, nothing like that. He goes straight into the ministry of Christ. Now go to the Gospel of Luke, verse chapter 1, verse 1. Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Now note carefully how Luke writes. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. Verse 3. Verse 2, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. Now go to the book of Acts, chapter number 1, verse 1. The Apostle Luke says in chapter number 1 of the book of Acts, verse 1, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. What's this mean? He's making a direct reference back to the Gospel of Luke that he wrote. And note carefully, the same man is mentioned in, in both books, Theophilus. If you'll notice carefully the way Luke writes this here, Note carefully, he says, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. Luke is definitely approaching this from the perspective of these are the events. I'm a historian, and I'm going to tell you what happened. Now, the reason I give you that is because Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what's called the synoptic gospels. I've told you that, you know, many times before. Synopsis means that they all have one view. That's what a synopsis is. Now look at John chapter number 1, the gospel of John chapter number 1, and verse 1. In John chapter number 1 and verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now the apostle John lets you know right off the bat that the focus of this gospel is going to be entirely different than uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It complements them. There's no contradiction here. He doesn't have his own agenda. What he does is complement for a later time. I wish you'd listen carefully to what I'm saying to you tonight. 
It'll help clear up a lot of contradictions, so-called contradictions. There's a lot of people out there that believe you need to be baptized in water or you're not saved. Did you know that? Look at Mark chapter number 16. Mark chapter number 16. And verse number 15. Mark 16, 15. This is one of the great commissions. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth. Now, if we could just get this second part out of here, you know, a lot of Baptists just don't like that. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, I'm not going to take it out of there. I'm going to tell you it belongs somewhere. It belongs somewhere. It has a place, and it has a reason for being in the Bible. Look at Matthew chapter number 28. This is another of the great commissions. Matthew chapter number 28, verse number 19. <clears throat> The Lord Jesus, Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Doing what? Baptizing. Now note carefully, this is something we do. This is not the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The Lord Jesus does that. All right. This is definitely a water baptism. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So how do we make sense of that? Because I want you to look at how John ends his gospel. Look at John's gospel, written much later. John chapter number 20, verse 21. Here is a commission John 20, verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Now, how many of you remember what the word Siloam means? Exactly. I'm glad you fired right back with that. Good. That's exactly what it means. The waters of Shiloh that flow softly in the Old Testament, that's what it calls them, and they flow down to the pool of Siloam. <coughs> A man that was born blind had the earth curse put on his eyes, and when he went into the pool of Siloam and washed, the curse was washed away, and he came seeing, right? Right? And immediately the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin and the rest of them kicked him out of the church. They kicked him out of the synagogue. And the Lord found him and he said, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He put the question to him, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe on him? He said, I that speak to thee am he. That's me. Now you'd be surprised at how many Bible commentaries and preachers in the ministry today don't believe that. He's called the Son of Man in John chapter number 9. The Apostle Paul said, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Now the Apostle John, Paul said God was manifest in the flesh. The Apostle John says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Bible says, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So I've got the Apostle John, and I've got the Apostle Paul agreeing entirely in the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is God. So I don't care what these commentators say today, and I don't, I don't care one bit how they feel about it. I told you last week that I got the critical apparatus from Nestle Allen. It's a little book about this big. I, use, I, I appeal to it about once every 10 years. <laughs> I've had it in my library now for 40 years. I, had, I got it when I studied New Testament Greek. That's when I bought it. And, and when I had New Testament Greek, I bought Nestle Allen's critical apparatus. And uh, they showed me how to use it. And from that day on, I stuck that up under my arm. And I said, I believe this Bible is the Word of God. And nobody's going to move me from it. Every place that these new Bibles try to correct my Bible, they've got a problem what is that? 
I can go to the very original sources that made up the Greek New Testament that this is translated from. And I told you last week that the majority of all of the material available to make up a Greek New Testament agrees with John 9 where he's the son of God. And yet they'll come along and say, well, the ancient witnesses uh, say son of man and on and on and on it goes. It seems like there's somebody in the Bible, or not in the Bible, but somebody messing with the Bible that doesn't like the idea that Jesus is the son of God. Now, Mohammed doesn't like that. Not a bit. And I'm sure it would anger them greatly if I told them, you believe the same thing a Muslim does. <laughs> of course, they'll come along and tell me, well, there are many other passages. Don't, don't talk about many other. Don't mess with the word of God. Amen. Leave it alone. Now, John's gospel, I'm, 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 I'm going to take you somewhere tonight. I hope you listen to me carefully. The gospel of John was written about 90 A.D., long after Matthew, Mark, and Luke, long after the kingdom was offered and rejected and the king was rejected. The first time that books are brought together that form a part of the New Testament canon was about 180 to 200 A.D., and it's called the Muratorian Canon. Remember that, Muratorian Canon. Somewhere about 180 to 200 A.D., uh, an a, a Italian back in 1700 found this. Uh, he was a historian, and he found this list in a, uh, in a library over there in Italy somewhere. And when he did, he found the books of the Bible, not all of them, but about every one of them. And he dated that thing all the way back to the first century after Christ. Now, that's quite a remarkable thing. It really is. Because it shows you that within 150 to 200 years, the New Testament believers knew what the Scripture was because the Holy Ghost had led them into that. But now that's not a New Testament like you've got in your hands. That didn't show up until later. When somebody could pick up all the books of the Bible and find them bound in one volume and hold it in your hands. See, a New Testament like you've got in your hands here with 27 books, it took it a while for that to come into being. In other words, believers maybe have had the Gospel of Mark. Maybe a New Testament Bible believer might have all he had was the Gospel of John. You see, every one of them had to meticulously hand copied. No printing presses. That's what the scribe was so valued for because he copied, hand copied, all of these scriptures. And remember I told you about the Hebrews how they are so, so careful when they copy their New Testaments, not the Old Testament, rather, and the Masoretic text. They have what's called a fence to the Scripture, which is called the Masorah, the Masorah. It's a fence to the Scripture. It tells you how many words are on the page. It tells you how many times each word is used. It tells you exactly the location, everything they need to know about that word. And when they get through, and when they get through copying that page, they can go back and compare what they're supposed to have with what they've got and see if they made any mistakes. That's good, isn't it? This is why when they found that 57-foot-long copy of Isaiah that was made in 300 B.C. that Brian Rowland that I mentioned to you about found in Isaiah chapter number 11 where the wolf shall lie down with the lamb, it says the same thing that the original Isaiah said in chapter number 11, only removed by 400 years. See what I mean? And this Mandela effect that they're trying to mess with your mind over, they're trying to destroy your faith in the Bible. And it's one of the most cunning, backhanded things I've ever seen. And some of these guys on YouTube act like they're such scholars about this stuff. And they're attacking the Bible. They're attacking the Word of God. And they're causing people to lose faith in the Scripture. Based on what? <laughs> if I've got something that's 300 B.C. and it says wolf and lamb, I'm going to stick with that. <laughs> you see what I mean? So they had a fence to the Scriptures. It was called the Masorah. And the Sophorim were the ones who made sure that everything was written down. The Sophorim was the writings. The Masara was the fence to the Scripture. In other words, it bound it up. And that's where we get the term Maserite. See? We get it from the Masara, the Maserites. And that's where you get the vowel points when you try to pick up a, a, a Hebrew Old Testament. Uh, 
pick it up and try to read it, and you've got a bunch of little dots and dashes there. You say, what in the world does that mean? Well, if you know what those vowel points, and you can learn them, they're not that big, that's not that big a deal. You learn what the vowel points represent because they're vowels. They're vowels. You put that vowel with these consonants and you can pronounce the word. So who are we indebted to to give us that Old Testament? We owe them greatly, the Masorites. Now, how am I to understand Matthew, Mark, and Luke when it talks about you need to be baptized in water, yet the Gospel of John doesn't say a word about water? Nowhere in there. Nowhere to be found. Now, what did John the Baptist do when he showed up? What was his ministry in preparing the world to receive the Lord Jesus? What was he doing? John the Baptizer. That's what that means. So he was the first Baptist. <laughs> I know a lot of folks out there believe that. But John the Baptist wasn't even part of the bride, folks. He was a friend. But anyway, he was the baptizer. So what was he doing? Symbolically, it represented that they had died out to Israel, to the Sanhedrin, to the corruption of their people, and had received the truth that John the Baptist was preaching to repent. Repent for the remission of your sins. Repent. Turn to God. And John baptized them. And he went so far as to baptize the Lord Jesus Christ. John the baptizer. So when we're baptizing after the fact that Christ has died on the cross, was buried and rose again the third day, <coughs> what did baptism do for John the baptizer? It gave him authority. The, the Jews came to him and said, by what authority do you baptize? You remember them asking him that? Who do you think you are out here in the middle of nowhere baptizing people? What do you think you're doing? And the Jews had all kinds of baptisms. They've got what's called a mikvah. And a mikvah is a square thing where you go down into the water and you're baptized. And when you come up out of that water, you can go over to the steps and you can walk to the top of the Temple Mount. You've been cleansed symbolically. That's a mikvah. So the Jews were very familiar with baptism. And they came to him and said, who do you think you are baptizing? Who gave you that authority? John said, my authority came from God. He said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. So when after the Lord had finished his ministry, ascended to heaven and told these disciples, he said, now you go out and baptize. He was putting on them the same authority that he gave John the Baptist. He was giving them that authority to go baptized to show that the message they were preaching was a message from God and it was coming with the authority of God. And there was no question about it. They could go out and do that. But by the time John writes his gospel in 90 A.D., nobody was baptizing. Now let that settle in for a minute. By 90 A.D., not a word. <laughs> <coughs> Some sorry little damn dog gave me a cold. I'm suffering with it tonight. And I forced myself and came here tonight to get up and that's what Saul said, you know. He said, I forced myself. <laughs> And uh, I'll, I'll, the sad thing is, I'll live. Amen. <laughs> but by 90 A.D., nobody's baptizing. And the whole gospel of John, no baptism. And the commission in John gets to a much deeper spiritual level. Notice carefully. What he does to them in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is to give them a commission. Now, you go out and you do this. All right, you go do it. But in the Gospel of John, he said, Now I'm sending you forth. And then he breathed on them and said, Receive you the Holy Ghost. Now that's a far different thing than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You see, he was preparing them for that baptism of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter number two. Now there's a lot of controversy about this. I was taught for years that the bapt that baptism with fire is hell. Now, you may believe that, okay, but why would you be baptized in hell? What's the point? This fire that came down in Acts chapter number 2 came down upon them as cloven tongues, and it was that day that, that, that they were put into the body of Christ. The body of Christ came into being as far as a living, functioning, organic unity on that day 
when they were baptized by the Holy Ghost into the body of Christ. And the symbol of it was fire. Now, if you'll remember last week, I don't remember when it was, but I told you how that when the Lord Jesus was baptized, what appeared over his head? A dove. And in the Bible, a dove is a symbol of purity. A purity. Not fire, but a dove. But for we earthlings... Who did, who, did, who did not receive the Spirit like he did in the fullness. We've received the Spirit by measure, every one of us, all of us, all of mankind. We were baptized with fire, the emblem of fire. What's the fire doing? It's purging, cleansing, purging and cleansing. And you remember what happened over there in Isaiah chapter number 6? If you don't believe fire purges, what did it say over there in Isaiah 6? How many remember reading that? When Isaiah came before Uzziah, the Bible said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and the seraphim were flying. A seraphim is nothing but a ball of fire that cries, Holy, holy, holy. You see, fire and the Lord is synonymous. The Bible says, Our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 29. Amen. Synonymous. Fire. The Holy One. This fire that protected them at night and the cloud that led them in the daytime, the fire. And so what happened? Well, the Bible said he took the thongs off of the altar, the, the thongs of the coat, and he went to Isaiah with it and he purged his mouth. He cleansed it so that he could go out and preach and warn the people of Israel. And it was done with fire. Now, I believe it's holy fire. How many of you remember when the first sacrifice where you can really see it showed up where the fire comes down and consumes a sacrifice. How many of you remember reading that? You remember where it was? It was Carmel. It was Elijah on top of Carmel. In the Old Testament, the way they knew that God had received a sacrifice was with fire. God would send the fire and he would receive the sacrifice. In other words, it was a supernatural, powerful fire sent forth from God, just like Acts chapter number 2. The fire consumed the sacrifice at the altar on top of Carmel and licked up the water. And God by that was, was showing them that I have received you and your sacrifice. To receive the sacrifice is to receive you. And I have received you. And he showed it by fire. In the Old Testament when they had the brazen altar outside the tabernacle, that brazen altar was to burn. Do you know where the fire came from from that brazen altar? It came from heaven. You did not kindle that fire. If you kindle your own fire, that's your own righteousness. God said in the book of Isaiah, he said this to them. He said, I want you to sit down. And he said, I want you to look at the sparks that pop up out of that fire you've kindled. And see how much light it gives you and how much protection you're going to get from it. That's what he told them in Isaiah. You kindled it. You built it. Now let's see what it does for you. But if it's the fire that comes down from God, it is a purifying holy fire. And that's exactly what he sent. And he said, you take the fire off that altar. You reach in there. You take that fire from the altar that came down from heaven. And you go into the holy place. And there you burn incense at the altar of incense, the golden altar that stands right before the curtain. And you burn it with the fire that comes down from heaven. Do you remember reading in the Old Testament where two people took strange fire into there? They were Aaron's sons, folks. Aaron. Yeah, 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 they sure did. Nadab and Abihu. And the Bible says a fire went out from the Lord. A fire went out when they were in the holy place. They took strange fire in there and it consumed them. Here's what that means. The Holy Spirit of God has come upon us. If you have ever received the real Holy Spirit of God, there's a purging that's going to take place inside your soul. That's what that's symbolic of. That's what's a type of. And that Holy Spirit of God is going to burn away the dross. It's going to cleanse you because the Holy Ghost is the one who does the cleansing. For someone to say that they are saved and their life does not change is a contradiction in terms. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Everything changes. You're not what you used to be. And so when this fire came down on these disciples in Acts chapter number 2, the ones that had been hiding before, they were hiding from the Jews and the Sanhedrin. 
now got up boldly and proclaimed the word of God. And Peter stood toe to toe, eyeball to eyeball, and said, I don't care what you do to me. I know what's happened to me, and some powers come on my soul. I'm going to preach the word of God. And they did. And the more they tried to persecute them, the more they spread. They sure did. The more they spread. So the baptism in the Great Commission, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, has to do, I believe, with God's marking his men to go forth with a commission to carry his word. But that came to an end when the grace of God, the gospel of the grace of God, took prominence. When that happened, you remember going through the book of Acts with me? The last chapter of the book of Acts? Did you know that God was offering the kingdom in a varied form to Israel all the way through the book of Acts? Did you know that until the last chapter of the book of Acts? <coughs> and in the last chapter of Acts, the apostle Paul said, well did Isaiah the prophet speak, saying, having ears you hear not, eyes you see not. The heart of this people is waxed gross, lest they should see with their eyes and ear with their, hear with their ears and be saved. And he blinded them. God did right there. Now that must have been a big deal, folks. Because at that point, the demarcation was settled. It was no longer Israel as a unity, as a unit, as a body politic, as a group. No more. Now it was whosoever will. Jew, Gentile, bond, free, red, yellow, black, white. And the apostle said in the last chapter of Acts, I go to the Gentiles and they'll hear it. It is that going to the Gentiles and them hearing it that fits in with this gospel of John where you got a, you, you're sent and there's power and there's unction and there's anointing and there's no baptism. And that's what happened. And that's where we stand today. And that's how, to, that's how to put together the great doctrine of the new birth that we find in the Gospel of John. Now, what if somebody had only had the Gospel of Matthew? That's all they ever read all their life. And they died. Let's say they died at 60 A.D. All they had was Matthew. Could they be saved? Well, of course they could. Every one of those gospels declare the Lord Jesus to be the Son of God in one way or another. Why, of course they could be saved. Absolutely. No question about it. And having nothing but the gospel of Matthew, that's all they knew. That's all they knew. But you've got a whole lot more today. You're accountable for the light that you reject and the light you receive. You see, when God gives you light, that's a great privilege. Amen. That's a great privilege. And you've got a gospel now that says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. <laughs> There's not a word in Matthew, Mark, and Luke about being born again. There's not a word in Genesis through Malachi about being born again. Not a word, although it is in there in typology and if you had read deeply into it and been led by the Holy Ghost, the Lord rebuked Nicodemus and said, Thou being a teacher, a master in Israel, and knowest not these things, you ought to know it. And he would have known it from the Old Testament, but he didn't know it. How can a man enter the second time in his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus saw it strictly on a natural level. You must be born again. Now, your eschatology is going to determine what you believe about the New Testament. Most people don't take the New Testament and then their eschatology. They take their eschatology and they read the New Testament through the lens of their eschatology. In other words, they read the New Testament through the lens of their church doctrine and what their church teaches. And that's a sad thing. I've been saved since 1973. I started out as green as that grass. About the only thing I knew was half the Ten Commandments and a few of the names of the apostles. And I knew the books of the Bible because I learned them in the public school system at uh, Beaumont Avenue uh, pub, uh, Grammar School. 
The public school system, wasn't that a horrible thing? That's terrible. Good night. Subject those kids to the books of the Bible. What a thing. Man, we ought to, we ought to prosecute those people. Good night. But when God saved me in 1973, he put me on a journey. He put me on a journey. And I went on that journey because I loved him. He'd saved me. He'd changed me. I wasn't what I used to be, and I knew that. And it wasn't long before I met an awful lot of people that I thought, my goodness gracious, man, you're religious, but you sure don't seem to have anything. You know, there just, just doesn't seem to be a witness. And then I met some people that had a witness. And I had some people, I met some people that were drawn to me, and I was drawn to them. That was the fellowship of the Spirit. And then I started reading. Man, did I read. I dug deep and dug fast. I had a lot to learn, had to learn it quickly. Folks, do you realize I'd only been saved three years when I came here to pastor this church? I was still nearly as green as that grass. I didn't know anything. <laughs> well, I knew a little. Three years I'd been saved. I'd been reading a lot. And I was thrown right into the lion's den. <laughs> well, I preacher, you came to a church, they loved each other, and they had fellowship and so forth. Let me tell you the truth. <laughs> they sat there and looked at each other and said, oh, we love each other. Walk out the door and cut each other to pieces. Hogwash. <laughs> but I was used to just the world. I mean, that's all I was. I was used to the world. It, didn't, it took me a while to understand religious, what the religious social order, right? I guess you might say it that way. It took a while to learn it. I learned it from experience, but I kept learning. I kept learning. I kept learning. It didn't take me long to find out that I could read so much after a man, I get to a certain point with him, he wouldn't go any further. And most of the time, he couldn't go any further because he got blocked with his doctrine. He wouldn't let God show him anymore, and that's as far as he got. And he'd been saved 30, 40, 50 years, but you're only going to go so far with him. If you'll open up your heart tonight, God will take you as far as you want to go with the Lord. Now, I mean, I, think about this for a minute. To the two on the road to Emmaus, he's, did, not, did they not say, our hearts burned within us? They'll, they never forgot that experience. The burning of the Holy Ghost inside their soul. And what caused that? What did he say? When he opened to us the scriptures. Ask God to open them for you. I do that all the time. And I say, Lord, don't let me lead people astray. Lord, open that book to me. And I continue to pray that prayer. Because that's the most wonderful journey in the world, folks. Is to realize how rich that blessed book is. A long time ago, I got settled as far as believing the Bible. When I walked the floor and learned New Testament Greek and could read it in Greek and didn't need anybody's Greek, I could sit down and take a Greek manuscript and read it. From that point on, I got up and said, I got this book and I believe this book and this book has no mistakes in it and every mistake anybody's ever tried to point out to me is a lie and they've got a motive for it. They're trying to destroy my faith in the word of the living God. My faith continued to grow stronger. I believe the book. That book is without error. Now, if you get to the point to where you just can't shake it and you still doubt and you still need your Greek professor and you've got to have your lexicons and you just are not certain about certain passages in the Bible, that's as far as you're going. You'll grow no more. So what are you talking about? I'm talking about the vast majority of the people who go to the church house every Sunday, especially the pastors in the pulpit. They were taught in their Bible colleges that the New Testament, the King James Bible, is full of errors. How in the world can your faith grow if you've got a book in your hand that you don't even believe? And one more time, so it, so it, one more time, so it'll, it'll take indelible impression in your heart. When somebody gets up in front of you and tells you the original says this, go up to him after the service and say, I'm so tickled to death to meet you. Well, hallelujah, glory to God. I've been looking all over the world for somebody like you. You got the originals. Let me see them, son. 
and you'll embarrass him because he doesn't have the originals. He's heard it and said it so much that he thinks it's a reality. It's not a reality. Nobody's got the originals. This is where Nestle Allen's critical apparatus that I was telling you about comes in play. And I'll show you, if you want to see it, I'll show you how it works. All of the different material available, the Textus Receptus is in there, the Vaticanus, the Washingtonius, the Alexandrinus, the, cun the, the Unctials, the Cursives, the Lectionaries, the early sermons of the Apostles, stuff like that. It's all, everything that we could get our hands on that goes back 2,000 years, it's all in there. And when you're going to make up a Greek Testament, you want to get the authority so you go, you know you're right. All right? I can show you that. They've got that. But they don't have anybody's original. It would be nice. It really would. It would be wonderful if somewhere over there in that blazing desert that they dug up the original Gospel of John or found the original Gospel of Matthew or the Book of Romans or some of the New Testament book. Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be something if they took that original, found it, laid it down to this book right here, and word for word? <laughs> oh, boy, we'd have some mad people. <laughs> because the whole premise of their ministry has been to correct and judge and, and, and criticize the Word of God. Your faith will never get any stronger than your belief in the Bible. Never. It cannot. The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. Do you have the word of God? Yes, I do. And I believe it tonight that I've got God's inspired, infallible word. And I believe because I believe it. The stuff that I'm giving out to you tonight, folks, the stuff I'm talking about with this period of time between Matthew, Mark, and Luke and the Gospel of John, it may be out there that other men have seen the same thing, but I cannot take you to anybody's book and say he's saying the same thing. I can't do it. Now, there are out there saying that, Matt, that, that John was written 90 late, 90, 85, 90, 95 A.D. Yes, I'm not the only one teaching that. But what I'm talking about tonight, the things that I've been bringing before you, I cannot find it where anybody writes that, although they may have written it. And mother, what's that mean, preacher? I got it from God. That's where I got it came from God. That's the point. came from study. And I, till somebody comes along and shows me where I'm wrong, and I'm welcome to do that, then I'll, I'll keep what I've got because it has increased my faith and blessed me greatly. How many of you tonight believe that election in the New Testament, uh, the word election in the New Testament has to do with salvation? I'm not trying to trick you, but what do you hear from people? Does it not relate to salvation? Sure. I say that with tongue in cheek. How many times have you heard some preacher get up and say, Christ only died for humanity. He did not die for the angels. You ever heard him say that? Well, I used to preach that. I heard a preacher say that, and it sounded good, and I thought, I'll get up and use that. Well, how do you figure the elect angels? Think about it for a minute. In other words, if election, every time election shows up in the Bible, it is a direct reference to salvation, then it's obvious that God saved some of the angels. Are you following me? Well, if he saved them, he had to die for them because angels sin. Angels sin just like human beings. You say, well, now, wait a minute, preacher, that opens up a whole new kind of worm. What it does is open up something for you to make you think. Think. This is why I say to you, show me one scripture. And I've been saying this now for over a year, and I have yet to get one phone call, one email, one letter, none. Show me one scripture in the Bible which says only the elect will be saved. They're stumped. They're stumped. They, they don't know how to handle that. The five-point hyper-Calvinist is accustomed to tulip and accustomed to you dealing with election. And most Baptists make a huge mistake by trying to explain election away. Folks, election is a real thing. He elected you or you wouldn't be in the body of Christ. It's a reality. 
But what they try to do is to take that reality and make it a universal reality without exception. And that's where they get in trouble. And they can't answer it. And thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Hallelujah. All right, I'm done. Father, I thank you for your word and for the time we've had to spend together tonight studying the word. I pray I've said some things tonight, Father, stimulate thinking. To make people think, Lord, think. Your word is rich. This, 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 uh, this simplistic categorization of everything in the Bible fits here, fits there, fits here, fits there. Lord, that's for our own uh, ego. There are many things, my Father, I've read in your Bible that don't fit anywhere. But I still believe the Bible. I believe it. And I believe that you're so much greater than I am. Who am I to think my little pea brain has it all figured out? No, Lord, I believe you and I believe your word. And I believe you have the answer. I pray it in Jesus' name tonight, Lord, and for Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Folks, I want you to remember Karen.